Spending time at the zoo is like a military operation. To keep all the residents fed, Taronga's kitchens never seem to shut. And the live food unit known as the bug house is quite literally always buzzing. It's full of little critters that are bred on site and others that are ordered in. All of the insects that we order in come in live. The main reason is insectivorous animals don't see a dead bit of meat and think food. They need that movement, that stimulation to make them want to go after and chase and hunt the prey. Nice, no thank you. I'll wait for your call, bye. This morning, Christine is preparing weekly orders for the zoo's insectivores, or insect-eating animals. The orders have to be um, very precise to make sure the correct amounts go out. We spend a lot of time putting all of this together for it to happen all in one day. We're sending one to Nocturnal, two to Retreat. These bags and boxes are packed full of insects in all shapes and sizes. This trolley is full of beetle larvae. So most people are pretty familiar with mealworms. The reason they're called mealworms is that they're actually kept in bran or like mealy sort of stuff, and that's what they eat. Morning, Al. Is the order in? Christine has worked here for four years, and she loves her bugs. Oh, they're adorable. Look at those little faces, those little mandibles. Insects are the cutest. This cute little just soft crawling around, it's a really comforting feeling for me. One of the most important roles of the bug house is to breed insects, including houseflies. This one net will produce a week's worth of maggots. This net alone produces 20 kilos in a week. Every day we put in an egging tray, and when we get it out, they are chock full of maggots. They are so thick in there, the containers actually feel warm. But maggots are just the first stage of housefly development that is fed to the hungry insectivores. Fly pupae is like the chrysalis for a butterfly, but for flies. The next stage is pupae, and they're just as much in demand. They're little packets of protein wrapped in a little case. There's this beautiful grainy sensation, like putting your hand into rice or seed, and they're just, they're quite cool. Though, I will admit, they do have a bit of an unusual smell. On an average week, we aim to produce about 20 kilos of pupae. This is actually our week's haul, collected from our fly room. To stop them all hatching into flies, we're going to freeze it. We want to have the bigger sizes for the majority of our animals. Other than that, the really small stuff is actually great because we can use some of the really small hatched flies to feed our really small spiders. With each stage of the fly's life cycle passing in just a few days, timing is everything, especially in the maggot room. So these guys, believe it or not, the ones I'm harvesting today, they're five days old. Tomorrow, when they're six days old, they'll start pupating and we'll harvest on day seven. Uh, if we leave it to day eight, they will be flies. These guys live on bran, uh, effectively cereal, and they get nice and big on it too, which is very, very lovely. We've got 16 trays to collect today, so there's a lot of hungry mouths to feed out there, and they all quite love these little tiny, tiny maggots. With her maggot orders nearly done, Christine completes the weekly insectivore buffet with some crunchy crickets, which are also bred at Taronga. Okay. We go through different sizes. So the larges, we only go through about 5,000 a week, but we go through a hell of a lot more smalls. So every day when we set up our large crickets, we actually put in an egging tray, something like this, and they'll just lay these beautifully, almost translucent eggs that are very, very tiny and thin, and in about nine to 11, sometimes 14 days, they'll hatch, and they're incredibly tiny. These hatched this morning, and these are very essential for our crawberry breeding program. So the crawberry frogs are very, very tiny when they're young and they have to eat really tiny food. Like every animal in Taronga's care, even the insects are cherished, until they're eaten, of course. So we're just pouring the crickets all into here. Crickets, they like being sheltered. So when they get buried in the vermiculite, they're actually not that upset. It's safe, it's dark, predators can't find them. 
We want to make sure that we're providing the best welfare for these guys so that in turn they can provide the best welfare to the animals they're fed to. So when these guys are happy and healthy, the animals that eat them will also be happy and healthy. Half of this tub is going to Nocturno House and half of it's going to our carnival team. When it comes to counting how many crickets we're assigning to each department, we have to eyeball it. It would take me quite a while to individually count 1,500 crickets into the tubs. And that's just a little bit silly for this morning. And with thousands of hungry mouths waiting, there's no time for that. Christine's only priority is to get the insects packed and out for delivery as quickly as possible. This is usually done within 90 minutes. Because after a certain point, the zoo is closed to all vehicles, so our delivery truck can't get through. If we're running late, it can stop function in the rest of the zoo, because if they don't have their food on time, certain feeds can't happen. And that's the last thing anybody or any animal wants. Taronga's Reptile House is home to a pair of elderly rhino iguanas. Hello, sweet girl. Hello, Vasco. Come on. In we go. Who are a bit of a favourite with Keeper Emma. We have Tabasco here, who is 24 years old. Uh, she's the boss of the exhibit. And we also have Blue, and he's our 28-year-old male rhino iguana. They are currently in a relationship, and they have produced many babies over the years. They're a beautiful couple. They are a terrestrial iguana, so in the wild these guys would be found in the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and they're from quite a dry environment. They really do well in our Australian heat. And when we look at them, they truly do look like little dinosaurs. So that little rhino horn on her nose there, that's where they get their name from. And those big chunky jaws are mostly for display, but they also mean that she's got a very strong Bite. She's got a lot of jaw power. Yes, she's telling me to go away at the moment. Oh, she's... Wait. <laughs> Tabasco. I know, you're the boss. But sadly, age brings complications. And keepers have noticed that Blue has been a bit off colour lately. Hey, little excursion buddy. We do like to keep a pretty close eye on our ageing animals to make sure that they're in the best condition that they can be. He's enjoying his little chariot ride. Right? <laughs> we have noticed that his left eye has been squinting a little bit lately, so that could be a sign of a cataract or some sort of other underlying issue. Let's pop him in here. Lizards rely on their excellent vision, so this is a red flag for Vet Gabby. So do you think he's been able to see out of his left eye since I then? I think his, yeah, his vision's dropped quite significantly and we've trialled it with food as well. You know, putting it on his left side, he just doesn't even see that it's there. Mm. But he can see you with his right eye? Yeah, yeah absolutely. He's very responsive. Good. So we'll approach him from the left. <laughs> Let's do that. <laughs> Safety first. Blue must be sedated before the team can put him on anaesthetic gas. But that's easier said than done. Stinky lizard. He's a strong lizard. He's got a big neck and some big jowls. Alright, he's gonna put yeah, that sorry. neck. It's coming from his claw. Okay, here we go. Sleepy time. Beautiful. Okay. Yep. yep. Before Gabby can intubate Blue, she must ensure he's had enough gas. And that's complicated by the fact that reptiles can hold their breath. Our goal is to get an airway access to him, so I want to be able to put a tube into his trachea for two reasons. Number one, it's, it's safe if I have access to his airway, and it means that we can breathe for him if he stops breathing, which reptiles often do. He may well jump when yeah. he... Yep. Stand by. Mm -hmm. Rhino iguanas are armed with powerful jaws and sharp teeth. So the team must be certain he's fully asleep. He's really good at closing his jaw with a lot of power behind it, so I'd really rather my fingers not be in his mouth at that time. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> no. Okay, a little bit more. He was pretending.
Located on picturesque Sydney Harbour, Taronga is one of the most spectacular zoos on the planet. But some of Taronga's most important work takes place in a car park. So we've got hundreds of, hundreds of species here at Taronga Zoo that a lot of people get to see on a daily basis, but there's a lot of things out the back that people don't see. And here is one of our, I guess, conservation facilities that people wouldn't be aware of. Keeper Michael is doing crucial work with an iconic and endangered Australian species, the tiny northern corroboree frog. At the moment, because they're just warming up out of their winter slumber, we're doing these little, I guess, small health checks on them, make sure they all look good, make sure they, they all look healthy, they're all alert and active. And so far, everything we've seen is perfect. So these little northern corroboree frogs are pretty special. They're brightly coloured, one of our most brightly coloured frogs. They're unique to southeast region of Australia, so they're only found up in the high country, uh, up in the areas like the Snowy Mountains in Kosciuszko and, and just the bordering areas of the ACT as well. They're a walking frog, so they're not a jumping frog. You won't see these guys jumping along, so they're a little bit different to most frogs that people think about in their backyards where they lay their eggs in ponds or in, in rivers. These guys lay their eggs in terrestrial moist moss nests. These little guys are actually poisonous. Not poisonous to me, and that's not why I'm wearing gloves. I'm wearing gloves more for the quarantine aspect. They sequester some toxins in their skin, some alkaloids from the ants and mites and other invertebrates they eat, but they actually synthesize their own toxins as well, which makes them immune to most predation. That means the corroboree frog's toxins would likely kill any predator unlucky enough to eat one. So clearly, predators aren't the reason these frogs are endangered. In the wild, we don't know exactly how many are left, but there's probably around a few thousand. And the primary factor driving these guys to, towards extinction is an introduced disease. It's caused by a fungus called chytrid fungus. And this fungus arrived in Australia back in the late 70s, early 80s, and it, it spread throughout the eastern part of Australia first. And unfortunately, we lost, we think, six species to the fungus. And many more, like the corroboree frogs, are right on the brink. So this is really a safeguard for the species. What you can see in the containers here, every container has got between four and six of these little northern corroboree frogs in them. So that way, if anything happens to this species in the wild and they disappear totally, we've got a good insurance population here. And hopefully once we work out better ways to abate chytrid fungus in the wild, we'll be able to really boost population numbers back up again with as broad a genetic range of the species as we can. I personally really love working with these little guys uh, for a couple of reasons. One is my interest is conservation management. But secondly, the challenges that go along with working with small amphibians. Amphibians are amazing in terms of how they breed, how they reproduce. Every species is quite different. The challenge of conserving threatened species is something that really drives me. And the, one of the primary reasons I'm here at Taronga. And even more exciting for Michael is around this time each year, he sees the payoff for his labor of love. Here are our northern corroboree frog tadpoles, and these tadpoles are pretty important. These little guys here are the start of a new insurance population. One of Taronga's most recent additions is a family of the world's biggest rodents. Hey boys, cappy cappies. The capybara, native to South America. Come on, guys. So these five brothers came to us uh, from New Zealand 12 months ago, and we uh, purpose-built this new habitat for them. And since arriving, they've been enjoying their new environment, perhaps a little too much. In the wild, capybara are semi-aquatic, so they eat both terrestrial and aquatic plants. Um, but they, they are mainly grass-eating rodents, and a single capybara can eat up to three kilos of grass in a single day. They've pretty much destroyed all the, uh, the grass in this exhibit. They've absolutely smashed it, yeah. But as the capybaras mature, keepers are noticing it's no longer happy families. They are a funny bunch. They have the similar kind of traits that you find in, in five brothers, no matter what species you are. They're reaching an age of almost two years old now, and that's an age when they're each starting to develop individually. Um, and because they're all slightly different individuals, they're, they're developing at a slightly different rate. So we're seeing the, the dynamics of this uh, group changing. They are interacting with each other slightly differently as they start to reach that mature age. Keeper Johnny has identified the brother that's really asserting his dominance over the rest. So this is Rodney. So he is the formerly the runt of the litter. 
now the, the heaviest, the biggest, the boldest of the five brothers. Um, he's the one that's been causing uh, all the trouble that we've had recently in this group. Him and one of his cohorts, Pedro, have decided to pick on one of their brothers. And it's, it's little behaviors like chasing him into the pool and making sure he doesn't come out uh, or, or chasing him away from feeding spots. And one sibling seems to be the regular target of Rodney's attacks. This is Carlos. He's the victim of the, uh, the discord and aggression that we've seen in the group uh, most recently. And you can see a couple of open wounds on his body at the moment, which I'm being very careful uh, when touching. He's copped a few bites from his bigger brother, Rodney. And as you can see, he's, uh, he's a bit nervous at the moment around any of the other uh, four boys. And he has very much been uh, put down to the bottom of the pile in terms of hierarchy in this group. In the short term, we're monitoring the Capybara group more closely. And then we're also going to bring the vets down here and see what the options are in terms of quelling the aggression and trying to sort out uh, some, of the, some of the discord that's happening with this group and try and bring harmony back into the Capybara environment. We really want to nip it in the bud before it escalates to something more than this. Perch. Good. Across Taronga, many animals rely on live food for nutrition and enrichment. And the food production unit, affectionately known as the bug house, provides this vital service. Food technician Christine is racing against the clock to get the weekly orders packed and on the delivery truck before the zoo opens. The deliveries go all across the zoo. There's so many precincts that he goes to. I think the only one that isn't included in the run is the marine mammal team, because they eat fish, they don't eat bugs. <laughs> First stop for driver Martin is the bird kitchen. Morning. Morning. Where an average of 10 kilos of bugs are delivered every single week. Our bird section is the only department that gets all three stages of flights. They love their maggots, they love their pupae, and they also love their live flies. But today, it's not just the clock that Martin is racing, it's also the sun. Seasonally, with the deliveries, we want to be very aware of the temperature. If it's going to be a really hot day, we want to have everything on the truck really quick, very fast. Who's your buds today? Cheers, mate. That's awesome. That stuff's frozen. Okay, put the press on now. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks, Have a good day. Man. Winter, we can be a little bit more relaxed in how long we leave stuff out. But in summer, it's on, gone, and back in a freezer as quickly as we can make it. Good morning. Good morning. Got our bug delivery. Yeah, do you want the inside? Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you so much. Next customers are the meerkats. Make a bit of mess who have been impatiently waiting for Danielle to deliver their breakfast. OK, little Marys. Marys! Meerkats are omnivorous, so they like to eat fruit and vegetables and a whole lot of insects. In the wild, their favourites are scorpions. If a scorpion was to bite a meerkat, nothing would happen. They're immune to the scorpion venom. So as part of their diet, we do feed them a lot of insects and one of these things is fly pupae. You can see they really like it. They like it so much that they have these little scuffles and these little tiffs over it. It's every individual for themselves when it comes to fly pupae, because it is a tasty little treat. Meerkats have very high metabolisms because they're active all day, so they burn their food quite quickly. So we do need to give them small feeds regularly. So this is just part of one of those feeds that they get throughout the day. Another mouth-watering morsel are the crickets, which are loaded into a man-made termite mound to tantalise these little carnivores' taste buds. The carnivore team get 1,500 large crickets in their order. There's one. That will last them for just a week. While the crickets keep the meerkats busy, the next bug house delivery is eagerly anticipated. Oh, Blue, the 28-year-old rhino iguana, has been having some trouble with his left eye. And this morning, vet Gabby is trying to solve the mystery. I just love his little thighs. He's in beautiful condition. Sure, an old boy, yeah. Yeah. Although he's an older lizard, he still has a good set of teeth and a powerful jaw. 
which makes intubation a delicate and lengthy business. It really stimulates them if you open their mouth once they're, once they're asleep. And if you start putting a tube near his airway, he will react. So he has to be nice and asleep. OK, let's give him another go. A bit of anaesthetic spray. We want to ensure that we don't squash the tube. OK, so we'll leave that in his gob. It takes nearly an hour for Blue to be fully intubated, which gives Gabby the green light to start the procedure. You can see his cataract here pretty easily. A cataract is when the lens has changes in it to make it look white. The lens is made up of fibres and the fact that they are aligned perfectly makes it actually see-through. So when you get inflammation and changes in the lens, those fibres don't align so perfectly so that you can see them. While the cataract is restricting Blue's vision, it shouldn't be causing any pain. How long has he been squinting for? A few weeks that we've seen. When you're trying to discern whether or not he is in pain, obviously he can't tell us, but he'll squint. So squinting is often a sign of pain. One of the most painful things you can have in an eye is an ulcer on the cornea. And so this dye just helps us pick one up if there's one there. He's got a tiny little ulcer on the cornea. OK. It's only small. Unrelated to the cataract? Yeah. So it's on the outside. Of yeah, the OK. Eye. Yep. Whether or not that's enough to cause the squinting is up for debate. So we're going to treat him with pain relief and we're giving him some antibiotics. Gabby flushes the eye clean with some saline and then begins a thorough examination of this ageing iguana. I'm also looking for any crepitus in the joints, which just means crunchiness, which can indicate arthritis. So far, so good. He's very good for a 28-year-old. While everything feels OK, only x-rays will reveal any serious deterioration. Okay. He looks so cute in that position. I do just like, look at that muscle. Just on first view, his hips look great, his ankles look great, his knees look good. The last thing on the list today is to get some blood and Gabby draws it from an intriguing part of Blue's anatomy. Lizards and snakes have a vessel that runs underneath their vertebrae of their tail. It's like a sinus rather than an actual vein. And pinpoint accuracy is crucial as it's not the only precious piece of equipment hiding in the tail end of this lizard. Mostly reproductive organs in the tail itself as well. That's where his are. Yep, and he's got a, a double banger too. He's got two of them. Got one on the right, one on the left. That's where I'll leave that. Oh, there's the blood. Gabby will send Blue's blood to pathology for analysis. It's all part of the hospital's general health check for its geriatric animals. He's up. He's up. It's an absolute thrill to work with Blue. I think he's one of the more unique animals we have here. And his exam's gone really well. Last year, he had a bit of stiffness in his right elbow, and that's resolved. All his joints move really well. He's got good range of motion in his joints, indicating that there's no arthritis there, and that's confirmed on the radiographs. How's he going? He's breathing nicely. OK. I'm happy for you to take yeah. him then. Yeah. yeah. He kicked up a stink before, but now he looks pretty happy. And just as well, for while Blue may look pretty good on the outside, he's got an unseen problem brewing on the inside. Sadly, once it makes itself known, it may be too late. Taronga's mundane-looking cluster of shipping containers, Keeper Michael's vital work with the endangered northern corroboree frog is paying off. As the next generation finds their feet, literally. Quite a few changes have happened here in the breeding facility. 
The northern crabby frog tadpoles have now mostly metamorphosed into frogs. So in this container we're looking at at the moment, there's five. Uh, all five little guys from this container have metamorphosed. We have four that have fully resorbed their tail, and we have one who's still got a little bit of tail resorption to go. He's got his beautiful crabby frog patterning, beautiful uh, crabby frog colours, uh, but he's still got quite a bit of a tail. So at the moment, he can't eat. All his energy at the moment is coming from that tail resorbing into his body. So in the, maybe another, I'd say, four to five days' time, he'll have reabsorbed that tail, and in about a week's time, he'll be able to start to start feeding as a frog. He'll start eating little crickets and little invertebrates. These little tadpoles have gone through significant changes in around a fortnight. So this little guy I've got on my hand now is a terrestrial northern corroboree frog. He's fully metamorphosed from a, a tadpole into a frog, and being terrestrial means he's now on land. He's only been an actual fully formed frog for maybe two or three days, so not very long at all. He's actually gone from a, a little swimming tadpole, which has gills for breathing, so he's lost his gills and developed internal lungs to be able to breathe. He's developed legs, he's popped his little front legs out through his through spiracles, uh, and his legs are fully developed now. Uh, he's gone from having a, a suctorial disc type mouth part to having an actual carnivorous mouth part to be able to eat. And not only that, his internal digestion, he's gone from having a long spiraling vegetarian gut um, to a short carnivorous gut that a frog would have. So his whole body has effectively changed over the last, over the last two weeks. There's some massive changes for this little guy. And for a species that's teetering on extinction in the wild, this gives Michael great pride and hope for the future. It's always great personally to see these little guys coming through at this time of year when they're metamorphosing, because it means everything's been done right, their, their tadpole husbandry, their frog husbandry up to now is great, and they're getting through as little frogs. For me, that brings a, a great sense of personal satisfaction that, that, that these little ones here are the start of a new insurance colony. And over the next few years now, we'll really build that up, and then I'll be feeling a lot more secure that should anything happen in the wild, um, we've got a backup. We've got an insurance population ready to go. Very happy. Taronga is home to a vast array of animals. Some you'd love to cuddle. Some you'd love to swim with. Some you'd love to play with. And then there's those that you'd probably prefer to step on. Yeah, what do you think's in here? We work with a whole range of species up here at the Institute. And in here is definitely one of my favourites. But in order to get him out, I've got to find him first. So I just have to try and gently remove the soil a bit just so I can find out where he is. Hello, gorgeous. <laughs> so this is a giant burrowing cockroach. The giant burrowing cockroach, also known as the rhinoceros cockroach, is an unlikely world record holder. They are the heaviest cockroach in the world and they come from Australia. There's about 4,600 species of cockroach and he's the heaviest. These guys, they can weigh up to 30 grams. And when you think about a cockroach that you might have in your house, American and German cockroaches, those guys weigh like 500 times less. You know, they're 0 0.06 of a gram. They're teeny tiny in terms of their weight. These guys are, are much, much heavier. While Susie treasures her adult cockroach, Keeper Paul is keen to show off some of its young. <laughs> there you are. So this one here is just a, uh, a sub-adult giant burrowing cockroach. These cockroaches uh, give birth to live young and the mum is the one that will look after the babies for up to a year. Unlike the, uh, the pest species cockroach they find around your house that can give birth to a couple of hundred uh, young each year, uh, these give birth to up to about 30. We've got uh, about 12 little youngsters here at the moment and they're about a year old. This one's got a fair bit of growing left to do. It'll get probably about twice the size, but it's definitely old enough now that mum would have left it be on its own. So, so this is just uh, one of many that we've got here at the moment. We do like to breed them ourselves, and they are relatively easy to breed. And the good thing is that if we're able to be self-sufficient in that way, we don't have to take them from the wild, and they make great ambassadors for the species, and uh, you know, they're really cool for our, our lessons and, and encounters and things like that. And despite their species reputation, these guys are not pests. They really are completely opposite to what everybody thinks of when they think of cockroaches. You know, they don't carry diseases, they're not you know, dirty or anything like that, and they really do help the environment out. 
a sentiment enthusiastically shared by Susie. So this is definitely not your average cockroach. They aren't something to be scared of. They're not gross or creepy. Who takes her fondness for this cockroach one step further. I love working with our cockroaches. I think they're so unique. They're so impressive. Me? Um, whereas, yeah, cockroaches at, at home, I just don't like them. <laughs> There's been some concerning brotherly aggression down at the capybara exhibit lately. Keepers are worried that as they get older, increased testosterone levels are causing fights amongst this once tight-knit group. The aggression has ramped up recently and the, the victim or the, the, the bottom of the pile, so to speak, Carlos, has been uh, found with bite marks on him. There's one main aggressor, Rodney. So to try to temper his moods, Vet Kimberly and her team plan to insert a device which will regulate his hormone levels. Kimberly to Capybara Keepers. Are you guys ready for us to head down? <laughs> Great, thanks, we're heading down. Because the Capybara are new to Taronga, this is new territory for Kimberly. I haven't done a Capybara before, this is his first Capybara anesthesia, I think, at Taranga Zoo, so we'll see how we go. Did a quick research in Capybara anesthetic and I found a paper. I mean, it looked like it was going to be a great paper, but it was all in like Italian or Spanish or something. Oh, I, yeah. did, I did find and... the, I found the temperature, temperature range, but um, it's all uh, I could find. Well, we'll treat it like a giant guinea pig and yeah. see how we go. As Rodney waits, the vets prep the needle. Come over this way. But if Kimberly hopes this is going to be easy... OK. Put that in. Rodney quickly sets her straight. You OK, fella. It's Bug House Home Delivery Day. So we're just pouring the crickets all into here where a week's worth of live insects are delivered to almost every precinct in the zoo. We breed everything up. And we, when we get it all to the right stage, then we can ship it out. It's been a busy morning of deliveries for driver Martin. And the last stop is primates. What do you got for us? Just one box today. Ah, oh, beauty. Love. Thank you very much. Today we've got our protein order, a bug order from the bug house. Looks like we've got some maggots and some mealworms. We've just got a little bit today, so a bit of a lunchtime snack. In the wild, squirrel monkeys feast on a balanced diet including fruits, flowers, leaves and a range of insects. Protein is really important for these guys, so that comes in the form of insects, maybe eggs that they might find in the wild, things like that. Our monkeys here love spending every afternoon in the afternoon sun catching bugs. They love it. Hey, girls, what have I got? What do you think, Pinky? A maggot snack. Oh, yum. So they're grabbing their handfuls of maggots and running. You can imagine, there's 12 monkeys, so they need a lot of bugs. So we supplement them with extra protein every afternoon. Let's add a few mealworms down there. The mealworms are their favourites, but it seems like maggots are pretty popular today too. They've picked out every little individual maggot, so you can see their little fingers. They're really small, very, very clever. They're great at using their hands. They're tiny little maggots, and they're excellent at picking up tiny things like this. Maggots for these guys are like chocolate. They love it. It's important for these guys that the food is live, though, and the movement of those insects captures their interest, and that's what attracts them to go and catch those insects. So thanks to the bug house, these guys have had a lovely little snack. The bug house is one of Taronga's behind-the-scenes powerhouses. But Christine gives most of the credit to the unsung heroes of the food supply chain. It's really great. I love doing my job. I love doing the job well. I'm always told that I'm a little bit too fussy with my bugs, but I, I love them. I spend way too much time fussing over my maggots, but they are my pride and joy. <laughs> I'm very proud of them. Keepers 
Friends have noticed that the five Capybara brothers are no longer getting along. The aggression has ramped up recently and the, the victim, so to speak, Carlos, has been uh, found with bite marks on him. So vets are hoping a hormonal implant in the main aggressor, Rodney, will lower his testosterone levels and help curb the fighting. Kimberly is struggling to anesthetize Rodney. So she hands the pulse syringe to keep a Johnny to have a crack. And Johnny hits the target first go. Just that Rodney has received his dose. As this is the first anesthesia on a capybara at Taronga, no one really knows how he'll react. So Nurse Liz keeps a close eye on him. Um, he's breathing well. The um, induction was very smooth and gentle. Um, so he's in a light plane of anesthesia, but so far everything's going well. Once he's fully under, it's off to the wildlife hospital for this feisty little rodent. We'll just weigh all that. Yep. And then the door closed. Subtract it from that so we can get up. This is the reproductive implant. In males, we use it to help quell aggression because it'll decrease the testosterone levels. It's going fine. Is this here or is it? No, just glue it. I just need to pull it out slowly and leave it as I'm pulling the plunger, <laughs> leave it there so it doesn't come out with it. Because we only have one. With the implant successfully inserted. Fabulous. I've just used tissue glue to close the little hole that I made. And you can't even see that there's an incision there. So it's very good. Kimberly takes full advantage of this first time procedure. Look at that little, little stubby tongue. There's not much of a tongue there. To get a close up look at the teeth that Rodney's been sinking into his younger brothers. Those incisors are very much why we, uh, we want to stop the biting behavior. It goes through flesh very, very easily. So those are huge. They look really nice. They're worn well. You get a good idea of how sharp they are, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big teeth to be biting yeah. the other guy with. Yeah, for sure. All right, I'm happy to take him back. With all signs positive, Rodney heads back to his four brothers. I don't think it's going to take him long. Give him a little bit of a pillow. That's good, yeah, that's great. He's had the reversal drug, so it could take apparently anywhere up to 10 minutes for him to, to kind of get, get up and start moving around. But I'm sure we'll start to see signs shortly of him getting, uh, getting better. While today's procedure has been successful, keepers must wait a couple of weeks to see whether the implant works and the group returns to the original five fun loving brothers. It's hard to know if this, is, this will be successful. We don't always know if it's gonna work in, in different species, so we're, we're trying this, but we'll see, we'll see. Hello, chaps. How are we doing? It's been a few weeks since Rodney the Capybara received his hormonal implant to control his aggression towards his brothers. Hello. In the first few days after the procedure, keepers were concerned with what they were seeing. Initially, that implant actually caused them to spike as part of its regulation process. Um, so we actually saw the aggression worsen slightly for the first week or so uh, after the implant was uh, put in. Um, but then that everything started to work and started to settle down and kick in and work as it should do. Um, and we've seen a, a drop in the aggression since then. It's not ideal to be a hormone implant in animals if you can avoid it, but in this situation, this is the, the, the best way to have dealt with this issue. In the wild, at this age, they would start to get on each other's nerves, test each other's boundaries and patience. And that's how they would naturally split up from each other 
uh, and spread that brotherly the genetics elsewhere. Um, but because we just have the five brothers here, we don't plan to breed them at Taronga Zoo. Um, these implants are a great way to manage their testosterone levels, uh, to manage that behavior as well that comes with it, um, and to keep them living very peacefully together uh, for the future. And thankfully, the target of Rodney's aggression is benefiting as well. So just behind me uh, on my right is Carlos. And you can see on his left rump there, he copped a bit of a nip from one of his brothers, uh, which have thankfully since healed up. Um, but he's had a, a much, much better existence since uh, those implants have kicked in. Um, and we've seen in the last few weeks that his life and quality of life has increased a lot. That's a fantastic thing from our point of view as, as animal managers and animal keepers. It's always good to see our animals in good condition and having a nice relaxed life. The zoo's elderly residents hold a special place in everyone's hearts. Vets and keepers strive to give them the best quality of life with regular checkups. So far, so good. He's very good for a 28 year old. It's been a year since Blue, the aging rhino iguana, was examined at the hospital. And although he was in good health for an old lizard, time catches up with us all. Me back. And now, there's only one rhino iguana in the exhibit. Hello, Basco. Come on. In we go. In we go. Blue unfortunately passed away from a stroke, and it was totally unexpected. Come on. Okay. Big day today. It was heartbreaking. He's one of my favourite animals, and you feel it. You feel it every day. Now that Blue's gone, it's definitely been a, a shift in Tabasco's behaviour. She is the queen of this exhibit. Um, she's not afraid to tell, tell anyone off for being in her space. Don't you bite me. And Tabasco is particularly territorial at mealtimes. This is what we call a lizard salad, and it has endive, kale, sweet potato, carrot, squash, zucchini, uh, tomato, egg, everything a, a lizard could ever dream of. And she's also got a couple of little treats here this morning. So she's got some mulberry leaves. Uh, she's got some beautiful hibiscus flowers, which she absolutely loves. Some thistles as well. She really loves those greens. These guys are herbivorous, but they will also eat the occasional insect as well. And even on a full stomach, Tabasco lives up to her spicy name. Ah, 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 no. That's not nice. You ran out of treats, so you start biting people. Oh, OK, you're going to do a storm off now. You are a diva. You've had enough of television. You're going to go sit yourself in the sun. OK. <laughs> While it's hard to know whether or not she misses Blue, Tabasco does seem to be enjoying her own space and having everyone looking out for her. She's the boss. She's the queen of this exhibit. I'm just her humble servant. 